Today is November 29th, 2011, and we are at the Multimedia Center of Lehman College, the City University of New York. My uh, name is Ann Rice. I have with me today Professor William Sorrell, who has agreed to be interviewed for the Lehman College Oral History Project. Welcome, Bill. Hi. Thank you for agreeing to be interviewed. Uh, for historical accuracy, would you kindly pronounce and also spell your full name? Uh, William Sorrell, uh, S-E-R-A-I-L-E. -E. Thank you. Um, so I was hoping that we could begin um, by talking a little bit about your background, where, um, where you were born, uh, how uh, you ended up coming to New York. Uh, well, I was born in New Orleans, mm -hmm. uh, 1941. And my parents moved to Bremerton, Washington, near Seattle in 1943. Uh, they had jobs working on building ships. And so I grew up in Seattle, went to college, Central Washington. And I left Seattle in 1963 to join the Peace Corps. Went to Ethiopia for two years. And while I was there, I, I began to realize there was a lot of history I wasn't exposed to. I saw for the first time like African achievements uh, in my visitations and and I came back, I came back to New York um, accidentally. I had, I had met someone in Ethiopia who lived in New York. Mm. So I decided, well, I'm way back to Seattle, I'll stop in New York. So I did, and um, that didn't work out, but I was sightseeing. So this person you met was a female? Yes, uh -huh. and uh, I was sightseeing, and I was on the subway, and I saw a sign that says Columbia University. I said, oh, let me check this out. So I was walking around the campus, and I came into Teachers College. And I was looking at a, uh, some posters on the wall, and I heard a voice that I recognized. And I turned around, and the person was Bill Hubbard, who was in, in my Peace Corps training program. But he had a heart murmur, so they wouldn't let him go. And he was working at Teachers College. Mm. He was earning his uh, master's, and he had a job scheduled in September. And this was July 65. So I met his uh, boss, and his boss said, oh, you can have Hubbard's job if you can type. And I said, well, I'll take Hubbard's job if I can get into teacher's college. That's how I ended up in New York to stay. Mm. And I came to Lehman in 1971, another accident. Um, I had gone to Vietnam to teach in 1967 in a, in a program similar to the Peace Corps. And I only stayed seven months because the war was intensified at that point. I didn't think it was safe to stay longer. So I came back, I worked for a year as a, as a teacher of high school dropouts in the Street Academy program, East Harlem. Then I got a job as a so-called editor of a textbook company. And I say so-called because I wasn't really doing very much stuff sitting around. And a friend of mine, uh, Joe Ryan, who was my um, housemate in Peace Corps, worked for CUNY. And he said, well, I'll let you know if there's any uh, openings. So he told me about Lehman. He said there's an opening for black studies. And what was the opening? Uh, for professor, lecturer. Mm -hmm. And that was, um, I came for an interview in December 1970 and got accepted and started February 71. Can you tell me what they liked about you during I, the interview? I had, I had a big afro, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which was amazing for them. And, uh, well, see, first of all, we had uh, an interview. There were the professor, uh, Bert Green, and um, William Crowell, who was the chair, and I think three students. And uh, professors asked academic questions, and the students said, how you can just pick Afro? <laughs> <laughs> and are you married? And said, yes. Is she white? And said, no. Okay, you're hired. <laughs> so it was very superficial in, in some regards. But it, it kind of showed the power of the students at that mm. time. And um, at the time that you were hired at Lehman, were you in already in the PhD program? No, no. I came here as a lecturer um, and in September 72 I, I entered CUNY Graduate Center for the doctoral program in American History. I figured look I'm teaching five classes five days a week there got to be a better way mm -hmm. <laughs> and the better way was to get a doctorate. I'd, um, I'd like to speak with you about your research but um, but before we do that maybe you can talk a little bit about what the campus was like when you came to Lehman and how you characterized the students? Well, the campus was a lot smaller, at least in terms of structure. 
Uh, we only had uh, Gillette and Davis, uh, the old gym building. And um, you, you had Schuster was there and Carmen had just opened up. The same semester I started, February 71, was the first semester that Carmen opened up. Uh, we didn't have the, uh, the library. The library was in Schuster. And um, the, the bookstore was, um, I think, in Davis Hall. Downstairs. And the gym was in the old gym yeah. building. And and uh, so the Performing Arts Center wasn't there. The Apex building wasn't there. Uh, the new library wasn't there. Uh, we had a big oval on the campus that's gone now. That's between where uh, um, the music building and and uh, the old gym face mm -hmm. each other. There's a mm -hmm. big oval. And uh, demographically, it was predominantly Jewish student-wise. Uh, it's probably less than... 100, 150 African-Americans and Latino students here at that time. And most of the students were in academic skills, SEEK program. Mm -hmm. And can you describe what the SEEK program is? The uh, SEEK program is Search for Education, Elevation, and Knowledge. That uh, had a lot of support from Percy Sutton, who was the borough president of Manhattan at the time. And it was an uh, opportunity with long open admissions to get people who never had the potential to go to college to give them the kind of assistance they needed, mm -hmm. uh, academic support. And what that did, that certainly increased the the, uh, the population of those two groups. And it changed in many ways the internal structure of the campus because it led to student rebellions to demand uh, black studies, Puerto Rican studies. So I know that, that you came afterwards, but um... I, I, we've spoken before about the genesis of the um, Black Studies Department, and, and I wonder if you could uh, just walk us through that history a little bit. Well, the lesson to be learned is uh, give people what they want initially, and they won't ask for more. And what happened initially was Black and, and Puerto Rican students, who were very small in numbers, said, Education Department, we want a course, the Black child in the urban setting, and a course on the Puerto Rican child in an urban setting because they said most of the Lehman students are going to be teachers and they need to have some kind of cultural exposure to those two groups. And so they met resistance. And so from a demand from one course, they demanded a department mm -hmm. or two departments. And so they, they protested, uh, they tried to get the Senate to make the change and they just, you know, being younger and probably energized by civil rights movement, the black power movement, they decided to take over some campus buildings. And what they did was, which is not the wisest thing to do, but they did it. They, uh, they walk out of, the, out of the classes, went outside and locked the buildings from the outside with chains. So they locked people in locked people to in, the building. I'm not saying that's the wisest thing because it's a fire hazard. And that got the attention of, of the CUNY administrators but keep in mind too the, the you know the uh, context. You had Black Power mm -hmm. uh, came out in 1966. You had high school and college students demonstrating, sitting sitting in, uh, marching, demonstrating. So these are things that people saw uh, you know, the potential, the power. Plus, um, you had the riots after Dr. Yeah, the King. riots in '67, mm -hmm. even '65, '66, '67, '68. And, and and Harlem is only about 15 minutes subway ride. And all this played together into the minds of the administration. Are we going to have violence? So are we going to have violence in, 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 in the Bronx? And so those kinds of demands all came together. And so the college went through the process and they established Puerto Rican studies and, and black studies. And there was a nationwide movement to yes, establish. Carnell. I mean, Carnell is a famous photograph of students walking out of the building with with uh, bullets uh, strapped across their chest and you know rifles in their hands and Sacramento you had the same thing and you had uh, across the country it was uh, a movement to establish black studies department well, because the, the, the thing was um, you know we want power I mean you had you had the demonstrations in Memphis where King was killed where people were sanitation workers who were only getting a few dollars a week you know, marching with signs, I am a man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here students say, oh, these are our spiritual uh, guidance. And, and we're men, we're women, and we want our culture and our heritage exposed. How did that translate into the classroom experience? Well, 
Uh, I came in February 71, so the department has just been established. It's only been around maybe two or three semesters. And uh, I had students who were really eager, and in some cases too eager, because I remember one time uh, a student said to me uh, after a class, she said, we all got so excited about what we were talking about, but you moved the subject. I said, I can't stay on one subject. <laughs> and she said, well, we go to the cafeteria and, and we talk about what you just talked about in class. I said, well, that's good. That's learning. But I just can't spend an hour on something that maybe calls for five or ten minutes. I got a whole curriculum to go through. Mm -hmm. So you had that. I had students who came, um, Diane Black, if Sherry hears this, uh, was one, came to class wearing combat boots. Diane, why are you wearing those combat boots? Oh, I'm ready for the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Diane, you're a student. I had other students say, I'm going to Africa. Okay. Now we see them five years later somewhere in Manhattan, three piece suit, 40 pounds extra weight, <laughs> briefcase. Uh, where are you going to Africa? Well, I'm working. I'm not working on <laughs> What are you doing right now? Oh, well, I'm, I'm down, you know, human resources. Okay. I can understand you're part of the establishment now. Okay. But that was, but at least they were eager. They, they, they really demanded to, to know mm -hmm. more. And that's part of the reason why we had a, a change in chairs at that time in the early 70s because students wanted more professors, they wanted more courses, and the chair at that time was kind of nonchalant about meeting their demands. And then one day they just appeared about 100 strong outside the uh, chair's office. And shortly thereafter, he was re uh, relieved of his responsibility as chair. And the... Um the, the student body was still in this uh, very um, active militant mode when 1976 came along. Yes. And how did how do you remember the fiscal crisis affecting our department? Well, it affected me personally because my parents, the June of '76, uh, were celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary in Seattle, and we didn't get our paycheck. Uh, there was no paycheck. We're, we get our paychecks then monthly instead of bi-monthly. Mm. And I, well, I got to go to Seattle for my parents' anniversary, not knowing when or if I would get a paycheck. But we got it eventually sometime in June. Uh, it affected the department because we lost a lot of people. We had mm. 12 full-time and a number of uh, adjuncts. And most of us didn't have a certificate of continuous employment or, or tenure. So a lot of people were, were let go, and we never recovered, at least in terms of those numbers. And what kind of impact did the fiscal crisis have on the students? It curtailed the enrollment, um, just like this current uh, increase in tuition is going to curtail enrollment because mm -hmm. a lot of students are working class, and even though it may be $300 or so, it makes a big impact. Uh, I read in today's paper, uh, a student said, we got to pay $300 more now for five years. She says, that's two months groceries for me. And that's someone on the board of trustees going out to dinner tonight. Mm -hmm. and so in that kind of context, it was really hard. Uh, I noticed every time there was a tuition increase, some of my students I see in the daytime, I would see them in a night class or a Saturday class. Now, what's going on? Well, you know, professor, I can't come full time now. So that was a tremendous impact. How do you um, see the the student body in addition to the fact that so many of our students work and um, and are shouldering multiple responsibilities? Um, you must have seen changes in the student body during the course of your time at Lehman. Um, I've seen changes in the classroom in, in terms of who's there. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first started out, um, um, some of my classes were all black students, whether they're in the Caribbean or a few from Africa or born in the United States. And I had a few white students. Um, I had a course on race relations and maybe had like three or four white students and civil rights movement, the same thing, but like black nationalism, maybe none. Um, a lot of the classes, there'd be no white students. And how did the black students feel about the white students who did come some, to class? Some didn't want them there. Some felt that they're learning something they shouldn't in other words, they're learning secrets. They're kind of, <laughs> let's talk about the history here. Uh, in other words, they thought somehow I was giving away information. So come on, they can go to the library and find what I'm saying. Um, so some felt that way. Um, 
Um, but it changed though because particularly with the uh, distribution courses, uh, a lot of students said, I think it's okay to take that class now. And they would come into the class and then they, they got more interested in it. We had white students who major uh, in black studies. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a student from Israel working for a second degree. And she took three of my courses and she majored in black studies. And so that wasn't wasn't too uncommon. And then by the time I retired in 2007, I would have students from <laughs> from the Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. and I had students from India and Pakistan and um, South America, you know, as well as the more traditional African-American and Caribbean type students. I wanted to um, I wanted to shift a little um, and talk about your research and um, particularly the um, because you you have written five books on African American history. Um, I'd, I'd like you to speak a little bit about each of your books and also about some of the contributions that that Black Studies has made to to scholarship. Well. Um, I always had an interest in history, even when I was in school. I remember doing book reports on somebody historical. And um, when I went to undergrad school, I wasn't sure what I wanted to be. I thought I wanted to be a, well, I'm going to be a teacher because the options at that time weren't very, very uh, much. And um, for a black person, anyway, in America in 1959 when I started college. But I wasn't sure what kind of teacher. And so I started out social science and then I. I played baseball in college. They maybe want to be a gym teacher, so I started taking some courses, uh, physiology and anatomy and zoology, which I really liked very much. But then I decided, I'm not taking gymnastics. I can't tumble, so I, <laughs> I'm not going to be a gym teacher. Bill, can I interrupt you? I just was wondering if you could, um, if you could tell um, me how um, college, what the legacy of college education was in your family. In other words, were you the first? Well. Um, yeah, my uh, my family, there were seven siblings, and none of them went to college except my, myself and my twin brother. Mm -hmm. uh, so but, this, you were inventing this as you went along. Well, I had I know I had eight cousins in New Orleans who went to college, but I didn't know of any other relatives who went to college. And I applied, and my twin brother said, you're stupid, you're not going to be able to do college. <laughs> <laughs> so I applied and got accepted. It was a state college, so they took anybody with a high school diploma in Central Washington. So he figured, maybe I'm smarter than what he thought, so he applied. So we went to college together and graduated together. So technically he graduated before I did because we were called alphabetically. Mm -hmm. And his name was Wilfred, and I'm William, so W-I-L-F before <laughs> W-I-L-L. -L. So technically he graduated first. So I graduated, and, but I, I graduated with a degree in, in uh, social science. And when I came to Lehman, um, I, I wanted to publish. I didn't have to as a, as a lecturer, but I wanted to publish. And when I started the doctoral program, I got encouraged by uh, Professor Eric Foner. Mm -hmm. He, he uh, one day said, I want to talk to you about your paper. I said, fine. And he was teaching at City College and I lived near the city. I said, well, come down to my house for lunch. So he did. And he told me an uh, article I wrote for him in a class. He said, I think you should send this to New York Historical Society quarterly. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. That was my first article in 1974. And meanwhile, I'm still a lecturer. And it was about? It was called um, The Struggle to Raise uh, New York Black Regiments mm -hmm. During the Civil War, which became uh, chapter two of my dissertation, which later became a book. Right. <laughs> but uh, during the time I was in grad school, I had about three or four papers published in journals. But I didn't do my first book until 1991 at the age of 50. For those out there who think uh, their careers are wasted because they haven't written anything yet. And uh, it was a biography of a uh, very interesting person, Theophilus Gould Stewart. Mm -hmm. uh, Stewart came from a family of uh, free people uh, in South Jersey near uh, Bridgeton. And they go back to the 1680s. Mm -hmm. And there were families who were so close knit, there was a lot of intermarriage. So you had the Ghouls, the Stewards, uh, the Lees, and a few others. And they were people who were doers, um, regardless of professions. Uh, Theophilus became a clergyman. He was a missionary to Georgia and South Carolina right after the Civil War. 
went to Haiti briefly as a missionary, um, wrote seven books himself, was proficient in Latin, Greek, Hebrew, French, German, Italian. He even studied Arabic, but he said he had no one to speak to, so he wasn't sure if he was really pronouncing words correctly. Um, mm. But he was a, sort of a thorn in the side of the, of the African Methodist Episcopal Church because he challenged a lot of the theological beliefs. And so he had a falling out, and he was never going to be bishop, which he wanted to be. So he joined the military as a chaplain, and then later on became a professor at Wilberforce University in Ohio. So I did a biography of this, of this person to really flesh him out, mm -hmm. because I thought he was an important person in his time period who, like typically, like a lot of people, get overlooked right. and then neglected. That was my first book. Uh, my second book was on another clergyman, um, Benjamin Tucker Tanner became a bishop mm -hmm. in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and who has a very famous son, Henry O. Tanner, the, the artist. And Tanner was was uh, editor of the Christian Recorded newspaper of the church, and then the first editor of the AME Church Review. And he too was proficient, you know, Greek, Latin, Hebrew, and also an author. And he he wrote about uh, Africans in the Bible. Uh, sort of a neglected subject and he said mm. they were there but the problem was they weren't known by the names that people associated with Africa so names like Kush right see? and and uh, so he talked he talked about the African presence in terms of Ethiopia and Egypt now all this is in the 19th century so again I flesh out his life to say here he's an important contributor in his time period then my third book was actually my dissertation mm -hmm. <laughs> and in my life, there's a lot of accidents that happen, and I uh, met this fellow, uh, Graham Hodges, who was at Colgate, but I was at a program at Columbia University for um, Herbert Apthecker, who was being honored and recognized many, many years after Columbia had refused to let him teach there. And Eric Foner was the moderator, mm -hmm. and so during the uh, question period, I raised my hand, and Eric Foner said, yes, Professor Sorrell. So I asked a question of, of Apthecker, and then Graham Hodges afterwards started talking to me and says, what's your dissertation on? So I told him, oh, he said, well, I'd like to look at that because... Can you tell us? You haven't mentioned it yet. Well, it's, it's, uh, my dissertation was, well, the title was uh, New York Black Regiments During the Civil War, mm -hmm. an examination of the 20th, 26th, and 31st United States Colored Infantry. So Hodges said he would like to look at it, so I gave him a copy, and... He was a general editor of what became Rutledge uh, Publishers, and so I had it published. Mm. And that was in 2001, and it was written, originally written in, in 1977, but then I made some revisions for publication. And, and, and that was, um, see, most things I do are pioneering. Yes. I do a lot of research in primary resources that you know, are dusty in the, in the archives, and I, I look at pension records, which hadn't been done at that time, to flesh out some of the lives of officers and, and men. And I did a comparative thing of, of what we call color soldiers and the white soldiers you know, in terms of health and diseases. And These uh, are the pension, the government pensions yeah, the from government, fighting in the yeah, government military. Pensions, which is very interesting. Uh, I always tell people, if you had any relatives who serve in any militaries, the pension records are always great for family histories mm -hmm. because you get all the information every time they moved the medical records, the uh, marital records. Uh, that's how you find out that the grandpappy had three wives, but you only knew about one. <laughs> you know? Or he had 10 children, you only knew about two. Mm -hmm. And it all comes out because it's all part of his uh, life story in the military and after afterwards. And then uh, my fourth book was a biography on John Edward Bruce, who was a black nationalist, uh, born into slavery in 1856, um, same year that Booker T. Washington was born. And who later on hooked up with Booker T. Washington as a ghostwriter until they had their own falling out over some of Washington's accommodation policies. And, and Bruce was uh, a journalist who wrote for over 100 newspapers. He had started some himself. He was called Bruce Grit because mm -hmm. he agitated people. And he, he uh, later on, he was a very staunch Republican, as most black folks were in the right. 19th century. But then he became somewhat critical because he didn't see progress in the, on the racial front. And then he got disillusioned and joined Marcus Garvey, 
uh, for the last about the last seven years of Bruce's life. And then my last book, um, which came, came out, out this year, came out this year in June 2011, was um, it's called White Women and the History of New York's Color Orphan Asylum, and emphasis on white women because they were Quakers and they decided in 1836 to take care of these orphan children because they couldn't go anyplace else except what they called the House of Refuge. And the House of Refuge was for destitutes and it was for people who were feeble-minded and people who were criminally inclined. And basically it would be a training ground for criminal behavior. So these uh, Quaker women, uh, Anna Shotwell and her niece Mary Murphy and, and Hannah uh, Shotwell, they, they, they joined together and they went through all kinds of obstacles. To, uh, to maintain the home. They got burnt down in 1863 by, uh, by mobs of Irish, particularly um, resentment over the Civil War and the fact draft that now riots. draft rise mm -hmm. is now a war to fight against slavery. But they, they persevere and they ended up in Harlem, actually, on Amsterdam and 143rd Street in 1868. They remained there until 1907, then they came to Riverdale. Uh, and the site now is the Hebrew home for the age. And they were there until 1946. It still exists today as known as Harlem Dowling um, and West Side Center for Children and Family Services. Today it's uh, foster care and family services. Mm -hmm. But for many years they took care of orphans and then later on uh, neglected and delinquent children. And again, I, I do all my research in archives, uh, looking at diaries and letters, correspondence, uh, minutes. Can you um, talk a little bit about some of the things that you found in the archive um, about well, the way what I found, say the last book, what I found the interest to a lot of people is that children were workers. Mm. They, they were indentured at age 12. I mean, they didn't have childhood. You know, I mean, it wasn't until late in the 19th century they began to think of uh, should children be workers. And that's why we had, uh, I think, 1934 laws prohibiting child workers. Uh, it may be revived under the presidency of Gingrich, but we'll see. <laughs> uh, child workers. Child but, janitors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're indentured at age 12. Now you think about yourself at age 12, how mature are you? And a lot of the kids weren't. So consequently, some acted out. They set fires to barns. Uh, one kid even drowned a, a young girl in the house. Uh, one girl tried to poison people three times until she got caught. Uh, and then also sometimes people didn't believe in niceties, so corporal punishment was the norm. Some cases went to the extremes where children were placed out in the in the fields in the winter time, and you know toes and fingers would get frozen. And so you had those kinds of things that, that went on. And what you had too was uh, it showed a lot of devotion on the parts of the women, even though they were somewhat paternalistic in their attitudes. But they, they persevere, and I'm talking about people who were famous. I mean, the families were famous, mm -hmm. and uh, if you walk in Manhattan, you probably walk past street signs with their names on it. What kind of names? Don Jacob Astor, mm. uh, you know, the Murray family, uh, R.H. Macy, uh, Theodore Roosevelt's parents, uh, John Jay's, Chief Justice John Jay's two daughters, and son. Mm. Uh, these are the kind of people involved with the orphanage. So um, so the kind of, of research, the, this deep archival research uh -huh. that you do and, um, and, and the scholarship that you've been involved in for decades, um, it's made, it's part of an, a larger contribution that, um, that Black Studies has made True. to yes. academic scholarship. Can well, you talk well, about I know that? now there are a number of scholars who are sort of looking at the history of Black Studies from its inception mm -hmm. until the present time. And see, again, before that time, I was in college, I graduated in 63. I never had a course in African American history. Mm -hmm. I had a course in African history. It was called Africa Since 1800. And it was taught by this little sharp guy with red hair, Professor Leroy. And I was excited. And I found out the whole course dealt with the history of Europeans in Africa. Yeah. There's nothing about Africans. It wasn't their history. It's just the fact that Europeans were colonizers and what did they do? And so it wasn't common, um, it wasn't common at all to have that kind of exposure. But with black studies and the fact that you have some serious scholars 
providing serious scholarship, begin to get new interpretations of slavery. Mm -hmm. Who were the slaves? How did the slaves react to their condition? How did they rebel? Uh, you know, books like John Blasting Game, The Slave Community, began to get new studies in terms of African contributions to American society, whether it's beyond like the typical, like the music, you know, contributions, but, you know, language contributions, contributions in, in, in food uh, preparations. Uh, I mean, things like, well, Africans came and they knew about cattle, like the Fulani people in West Africa. Mm -hmm. And cowboys, in many cases, cowboys were black people. Right. I mean, like there were over 5,000. And, and uh, people who were trailblazers were of African descent out west. And, you know, the town of Centralia, Washington, was founded by a black man. And the first guy to produce wheat in the wintertime was a black man in the state of Washington. So all this kind of scholarship is, whether it's sociology or music or history or psychology or economics, it, it began to feed into what we call the mainstream of studies. And so it made a change. It, it, it impacted on the, on the journals that were stayed and totally ignored these topics. And now, now they have these, these kinds of articles appearing in those journals, whether it's history or literature or any other sociology and subject you can think of. And two, it impacted across the country in terms of departments. So if you look in the, the Chronicle of Higher Education, they have a list of all these jobs listings. And you look under, they got a listing under like African American, whether it's history or mm -hmm. African American literature, and you see all over the country. And it's spread. Uh, someone in Japan can get a doctorate in, in African American studies or in France or Italy. Well, it's been very interesting to me being, um, having started to attend American studies conferences mm -hmm. in other <clears throat> countries, mm -hmm. um, the amount of interest that people have in um, who study America from afar, sure. um, they're extremely interested yeah, in the it's, black it's, it's experience. It's a different perspective too. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I met a young woman about ten years ago in Schomburg. She's from Italy, and she was doing literature studies. And uh, I asked her what, and she told me. And we had a little correspondence for a while. In fact, she sent me a, a letter once. She said, "Oh, professor, I'm not so used to doing papers." I found out I need to have a bibliography. Oh, no. <laughs> she says, can you go to the library, please? And because she, she, she looked at the books, but she didn't do the citations mm -hmm. fully. She just had like Zora Neale Hurston and she didn't have like the full title and the publisher and so forth. I said, can you do this for me, please? <laughs> <laughs> so she gave me a list of about 10 books that were, weren't completely, uh, you know, uh, inclusive of all the information. I said, okay. So I did it for her and, she was very appreciative. So, okay, you ever come to my country? I'll, I'll fix you pasta and wine, you know. But then I met, like I said, met the young woman from Israel who's, and then I, I um, and see, these are people who, who want to go back sometime and, and do something. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Japan, like I mentioned, they, they, they study black studies in Japan. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, in in terms of, of the kind of innovative research that you've been doing and, um, bringing this hidden history to light, it must have affected your pedagogy in the classroom. Yeah, it has, it has um, because um, I mean, students can say, oh, you wrote a book. Sometimes mm -hmm. they say, you wrote a book, like, are you the, <laughs> that smart to write a book? But um, I think it gave them some pride to know that the professor wrote a book or, or books. And, and you never know, again, like the impact that you have on students. Um, I'm sure today, maybe someone out there getting a doctorate or working in literature uh, got ex uh, excited over something I said, you said, mm -hmm. or someone else said in the classroom, and who may become the scholars of the future. Well, so I think I, that's important. And then, too, like I, I remember in some of my classes, I would cite things historically. I said, this is what people believe. Mm -hmm. And like one I remember saying, uh, there was a book on Ulysses S. Grant. And the author says, the Negro sat under the tree playing the banjo, waiting to be freed, mm -hmm. waiting for someone else to free him. And that was written in 1928. I said, come on. There were almost uh, 180,000 black men in the United States Army in the Civil War, most of whom were runaway slaves who were taking a huge risk. Right. Because they got caught, they'd be executed as, as traitors to a um, sudden cause. I said, they freed themselves you know, by running away. So how can some... So write a book about Grant and say the slave 
sat on the tree strumming the banjo, waiting for someone to come along to give him freedom. And so I'm bringing in that kind of information, or I would, you know, talk about um, race relations, say in the late 19th century, at a time when there were a numerous number of inventions of Af by African Americans that, that helped America go forward industrially. And yet the popular conception was they don't have a brain. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't have a soul. And, and uh, I remember, I remember uh, in my book on Theophilus, I have a section where I'm talking about Americanization. When during World War I, there was a lot of concerns about all these Europeans who were here and, and where was their allegiance? Was it to America or was it to the Austro-Hungarian Empire or to Germany? And so that's when they first started to have Western civilization taught in the colleges to try to make all these so-called alien right. people become Americanized. And Du Bois says, if you're not trying to Americanize us, <laughs> how long have we been here? Exactly. You know, you're ignoring us. So I bring this stuff out in the context of, hey, this is why A. Philip Randolph refused to support the war. In, in 1917, when America went into World War I. Because he's saying, you, you can't even protect us. So why should we fight for you? And I told my students, if anybody here's an artist, I want some of this money if you ever do this. Make a t-shirt, show the Statue of Liberty, help beneath it, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free, and from the torch, have a noose with, a, mm. with someone being lynched. And then say, like, what about us? You know, aren't we tired? Aren't we poor? Don't we deserve your support too? So one, um, one thing that uh, stands out from your career at Lehman is your teaching and um, just the animation with which you're describing the classroom experience yeah. gives us a little taste of, of why you were yeah. named Teacher of the Year. Um, and I'm wondering if, um, as part of being such a dynamic teacher, if you've maintained <coughs> relations with some students from um, your years at Lehman? Uh, I only maintain relations if I see them on the street. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have phone numbers and email and those kinds of exchanges, no. But I do run across students in strange places. Um, and again, I don't know who they are because they said they were in my class in 1974 or 1983. But I run across police officers who were in my classes. Uh, I run across, um, well, ran across one guy at the South Street Seaport. He was dressed casually. Hi, professor. Oh, hi. Uh, what's your name? And he told me his name. When you're in my class, he told me, uh, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm working. I'm undercover cop. <laughs> my favorite story, though, I was getting on the subway. I was trying to get on the subway, 149th and Grand Concourse. I came down the steps. The door closed. So I go stand right next to the door. I see this guy with the goggles on. He looks out the window, and then he has a smile on his face, and he opens the door. So I guess nice. So I go sit down, and I look up. He takes off the goggles. He says, you're lucky I opened the door for you. You gave me a seat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's okay, man, thanks. <laughs> you know, like that. And um, I ran across a student the other, about a month ago on, on uh, Adam Clayton Powell and 145th Street. I said, professor, professor. Turn around. This guy looked like he was a uh, three-day drunk or something. <laughs> he said, professor. I said, I said yeah, he said, Oh, man, you were my teacher. He said, back in wherever year it was, he says, man, I learned a lot in that class. You know, you were a good teacher. <laughs> okay, let me get too close now. But thanks for the compliment. Well, wait, as, you, um, as you look back over your teaching career and your, um, of course, your involvement at Lehman, you were very involved in... Um, on various committees and um, over your, your research and your teaching, sure. is there one thing that you can um, that you can point to as the most fulfilling or the, the the achievement that makes you the most proud about your time in academia? Well, when I came here, Black Studies, along with Puerto Rican Studies, didn't get a lot of respect from I think fellow professors, and uh, I think the fact that they thought we were just jiving in the classroom, not really anything serious. That I did serious research and and you know publications, and I think that gave uh, them a different perspective on what was black studies. 
And so I think to a degree, the credibility, uh, I think I deserve some credit for giving the department credibility mm -hmm. at that time. I mean, that's important because that means you get more lines, you know, we never got enough lines, mm -hmm. but at least it means that people now see you as a credible professor. Because I, I remember the days when I would go, you know, some cocktail party. Oh, what do you do? I'm a college professor. Oh, what do you teach? Oh, I'm, I teach history and black studies. Oh, okay. And then all of a sudden, like, where'd that person go? <laughs> you know, like, like they just like dismissed you as being something as a flake, uh, not really a serious scholar, but like, things have changed. And I'm proud of the, let me again, I'm proud of the fact that I taught about at least seven to 8,000 students yes. in, in 36 years. And I, uh, when I retired, uh, they had a little write up in the um, Lehman Today the alumni magazine. And I still had the Lehman email at that time. And I got about a half a dozen emails from students who, oh yes, professor, I'm doing this now. And thank you very much because you, know, you gave me guidance or you gave me inspiration. And I still get that when I meet people in the streets. First thing they say, oh, you're such a great professor. And you know, I learned so much. And even one student told me she started a, a school. She started a school mm -hmm. somewhere in like South Carolina, like a small school. Yes. Because she just wanted to give students the knowledge that she said that she gained herself in the classroom. So we only have a few minutes more. Um, I'm wondering, uh, it, you've been retired for a few years now, and four, you yeah. four years, yeah. and you've had a book come out of um, during that time. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm wondering if you have another project in the pipeline. Uh, she's three and a half years old, <laughs> my granddaughter. Uh, that's my little project. Um, nothing research-wise at this point. I um, see research, serious research and publication would take like three years, roughly. Maybe less, maybe longer, depending on the topic and availability mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. resources. And I'm kind of waiting for something to hit me. Like, tell me, okay, now let's research this. Because I think in my cases of my three biographies, they, they came to me in the nighttime mm. and said, okay, mm. it's my turn. <laughs> my turn now, write about me. Maybe maybe you'll have a woman come now that you've Well, the thing is, see, I, 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 see, my first, see, my first book, I really want to write about Theophilus' wife, Susan uh, McKinney Stewart, who was the first African-American female physician in the state of New York and third in the country, who was very prominent. Uh, she uh, graduated from medical school in 1870, very prominent doctor in Brooklyn, very wealthy. And I just can't find her yes. papers. That's, that's a problem. I can't, I can't find, I can't find diaries and letters mm -hmm. and, and I want to write it. I did an article on her, but I did an article on another woman, uh, Henrietta Vinton Davis, who was an actress who uh, joined the Garvey movement and became very active uh, as an officer as uh, one of the vice presidents. She went to Liberia on behalf of Garvey. Same thing, I just can't find enough to flesh her out to make a book. I, can, I did an article on mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. And there are other women who I've come across and said, where are their papers? And that's the problem. If I could find their papers, I would do the research. Mm. If someone could tell me, well, I have a box full. Because see, in Theophilus' case, his granddaughter had three boxes of his papers in Ohio that she never looked at. And there's nothing in his papers about Susan except a couple receipts of money orders when he was in the Philippines with the military in 1900, mm -hmm. that he had sent her some money orders to Ohio. But there's no letters. There's no diaries. There's nothing. Maybe they'll surface. I hope so, because I mean, these are stories. There's so many stories out there that need to be told. I agree. Just too many. And, and I look forward to the next story that you choose to tell. Okay. And I wanted to thank you so much for agreeing to uh, be part of this oral history project and also for um, everything that you've done oh, okay. for our department and for me over the years and for those students whose lives you've touched. That sounds like there's no check coming in the mail. There's no check. No. <laughs> You could have told me that an hour ago. <laughs> I, I would have said, oh, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do this interview. Okay. Thank right. you very much, Bill. It's a freebie. Okay. And that's a wrap. <laughs> that's a wrap. <laughs>